Thank you. All right, it is uh, with my great pleasure that I get to introduce Will Weaver for his um, talk today. Will came to us, uh, came to U of M in September 2019 after getting a BA from the University of Colorado. Uh, he worked with uh, Stacy Smith there, who a lot of people may know. Uh, he had a diverse set of training, uh, but in particular, he has a very unique skill set uh, in machine learning and computer vision. And so I think we're going to get to see a lot of that uh, today. Uh, but in particular, as an undergrad, he developed some really interesting methods that he's continuing to work on um, that are used for extracting data from herbarium images that uh, take advantage of machine learning techniques. Um, and this is um, a really important uh, resource that um, with the developments that he's working on have the opportunity to transform how we collect phenotypic data for plants. And so um, anyway, really looking forward to his talk. And so we'll take it away. All right, thanks for that introduction, Stephen. Okay, so today I just wanted to start by taking a look at some leaves that I came across last fall. I'm sure this is a familiar sight. I'd wager most of us see leaves just about every day. Given how prevalent leaves are, it's surprising how little we know about why different species have different leaf shapes, why some lineages have extreme shape variability, and why leaf shape can vary even within an individual. So today we'll be looking at new methods for quantifying leaf shape and how we might be able to tease apart the balancing effects of selection and ancestry on leaf shape among angiosperms. So here's an overview of my presentation today. We'll start by getting into shape. We'll go over some background information, some leaf shape patterns, and some problems that are associated with studying leaf shape. To center our discussion, here is a phylogeny of verde plantae, or green plants. Near the bottom, we have green algae, and then at the top, we have angiosperms, which are the flowering plants. For some context, there are roughly 1,000 extant gymnosperm species and well over 250,000 extant angiosperm species, perhaps as many as 350,000 species, depending on how we count them. And the impact of angiosperm species on biodiversity is truly astonishing. Darwin famously remarked that the origin of angiosperm diversity was an abominable mystery, and that's still largely true. Um, for today's talk, my, my project, um, I will be focusing on angiosperms, and specifically the astonishing diversity of angiosperm leaves. Studying leaves dates back to the Victorian period, and unsurprisingly, Darwin was a fervent uh, botanist, and more of his time was spent studying plants than any other system. The incredible diversity of plants and their representation in the fossil record spurred much of Darwin's research, and he rigorously tested his theory of natural selection by breeding and crossing plants in his gardens. Another early botanist, um, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, discovered that leaves were essentially building blocks for plants, and that many features were derived from leaves, such as flower petals. Even though the vertebrate anatomist, Sir Richard Owen, is credited with coining the term homology, von Goethe realized that many traits of related species could be transformed to fit different purposes. While not all of von Goethe's ideas have held up, he was correct about the serial homology of angiosperm leaves. All right, so now we're going to go over some basic leaf anatomy. My project is mostly concerned with leaf marginal shapes. So on the right, we have some dentate margins and some serrate margin examples, as well as an entire margin, which is smooth. And on the left, we see a lobe and a sinus. And below that is a leaflet, which is part of a compound leaf. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. And finally, the leaf blade or lamina is attached to the stem by a petiole. On the left, we have a white oak leaf, which, is, uh, which has well-defined lobes and a non-entire margin. And on the right, we have white mulberry, which has a toothed margin, which is also considered a non-entire margin. So each of these photos shows a single leaf. On the left is white mulberry, which is a simple leaf. In the middle is smooth sumac, which is an example of a compound leaf. 
And finally, on the right, we have Kentucky coffee tree, which is bipinnately compound. So the petiole splits twice before we reach a leaflet. And here, each arrow is pointing to a single leaflet on the overall leaf structure. Those were all fairly typical leaves, but here are some examples of highly modified leaves that show just how crazy angiosperms are. Um, these leaves were co-opted for another purpose. So Saracenia and Nepenthes use their leaves to trap insects. Cacti modified leaves into spines for protection and shading. And the genus Gloriosa has leaves with tendrils that help the plant climb. All right, so now we're going to transition to talking about some leaf shape patterns. Some families have virtually identical leaves, so much so that they're not that helpful for determining taxonomy. In many taxonomic groups, leaf shapes are typically associated with specific environmental conditions. And going back to our first picture, you'll notice that many of the leaves have non-entire margins. They have teeth and lobes, and they come in many different shapes. But there are lots of exceptions. For example, pawpaw has large entire leaves and is in the primarily tropical family Ananaceae. And another example is spicebush, which is also a member of a predominantly tropical family, Lauraceae. In contrast to Michigan forests, this is what you might see when looking up through a rainforest canopy. You'll notice that many of the leaves have smooth edges and tend to be more round or ovate. This pattern has been observed for quite a while. In 1916, Bailey and Sinat described the tendency of angiosperms to have non-entire margins in temperate climates, while tropical plants tend to have smooth and entire margins. They also noted how unreliable leaf shape was for determining species relatedness and common ancestry. Even species in the same genus can have wildly different leaf shapes. For example, these are sister species in the genus Begonia. They share most major floral and vegetative traits, but they have completely different leaf shapes. The biggest difference being that Europhyla has entire peltate leaves, while Heraclifolia has dissected leaves. Alternatively, some sister species have nearly identical leaves, while other traits of the plant vary, as is the case for these rhododendron sister species. Leaf shape can be influenced by evolutionary history, um, for example, even though oaks have high leaf shape disparity, their leaves are still visually identifiable to us as an oak, and that's similar for maples and poplars. Um, this suggests that there are often constraints to leaf shape, even in groups with high disparity. And ostensibly, these shape differences can be quantified. Another issue that I'm looking to address with this project is the inadequacy of many morphometric methods for studying macroevolutionary patterns. Traditional morphometrics rely on basic measurements like leaf area, perimeter, and ratios, while geometric morphometrics are computational and rely on landmarks. Here's a geometric morphometrics approach in the program MASS. Um, a leaf outline can be characterized by an elliptical Fourier descriptor, which essentially fits a curve to the leaf outline. And then a Procrustes analysis is used to align hundreds of leaf outlines, and we can then compute the mean shape. In both of these cases, it's difficult to compare disparate shapes. Traditional metrics cannot adequately describe the leaf outline, and elliptical Fourier descriptors describe specific landmarks. So if you're comparing leaves that have very different sets of landmarks, like leaves with lobes to leaves that have entire margins, then the morphospaces are not necessarily directly comparable. So we need a method that allows us to compare disparate shapes in a unified morphospace. Um, I will also frequently use the term disparity today, and I'm re referring to the diversity of form within and among clades. Another difficulty in shape analysis is how to summarize the shape data. Means can oversimplify variation of the data, Intraspecific variation may produce multimodal shapes that would be lost if you take the mean. So we also need better methods to capture the inherent variability of leaf shape data. And then finally, we have the issue of scale. Most studies have approached leaf shape, um, the, have approached the problem of leaf shape from either end. 
they are either clade focused, which has the benefit of providing detailed insight, but then lacks macroevolutionary context. On the other hand, some studies have looked for shape associations across higher taxa, which tends to underestimate the number of shape transitions. In both cases, most leaf shaped studies have relied on discrete characters, such as the presence or absence of leaf teeth, or have used continuous characteristics like elliptical Fourier descriptors that then are not easily generalized across disparate taxa. So this is a phylogeny from Gibbon and Kriebel 2017, which looks at the evolution of leaf teeth across angiosperms <coughs> using binary data. And if we focus on just the order dipsicales, we can see how this type of study could be misleading. In red is a zoomed in portion of the order level phylogeny. And on the left is a phylogeny of the genus Viburnum, which is in the order dipsicales, with teeth plotted as black and white dots. From the order level phylogeny, there are at most two transitions from entire to toothed. But in the Viburnum study, we can see that there are probably between eight and 14 transitions in the genus. Ideally, we would like to have the resolution provided by the Viburnum study while also being able to look for patterns of heterogeneity across angiosperms. Okay, so now that we have some background information, let's get to the guiding questions for my project. My first methodological aim relates to data collection. If I'm going to compare leaf shapes across angiosperms, I'm going to need hundreds of thousands of leaf measurements, which currently don't exist. To that end, I will talk about the software I've been developing called Leaf Machine, which leverages a suite of machine learning and computer vision algorithms to automate the process <coughs> of collecting leaf trait measurements. My second methodological, methodological aim involves how we can summarize leaf shape data for statistical and phylogenetic analyses. I'll talk about persistent homology and how I plan to use it to generate leaf archetypes. For my first biological aim is heterogeneity and the evolution of interspecific leaf shape variation associated with ecological parameters. And the goal of this chapter is to determine where changes in leaf shape disparity occur and whether changes in disparity are associated with environmental parameters. Finally, is heterogeneity of leaf shape disparity associated with diversification? And to be clear, I don't necessarily expect a correlation between disparity and diversification, but comparing the heterogeneity of diversification rates with disparity may still be informative for some clades. In most cases, it's unlikely that speciation or extinction is caused by leaf shape, but speciation could relax or tighten evolutionary constraints on leaf shape and lead to greater or lesser leaf shape disparity. Okay, so now we're going to transition to my methodological aims, beginning with how I'm going to actually collect the data for my project. The data I'll be using are measurements taken from herbarium specimens. And here are some photos that I took on a trip to the Missouri Botanical Gardens. Herbarium specimens are stored in these cabinets, but millions of images have already been digitized and many more will be digitized in the coming years. And I will be using these digitized specimens. If you're not familiar with herbarium specimens, here are a few fun ones. On the left is coffee from 1780. And in the middle is tea leaves from 1841. And on the right is liquid ambar styrosiflua, or sweet gum, from a few years ago, just because it's a super cool plant. So a lot of the questions I'm asking are currently severely limited by data availability. So a lot of this talk is going to focus on making sure we can adequate, actually generate the data required to address these broad macroevolutionary questions. Currently, we lack robust phenotypic trait measurements of all kinds. Looking at two of the largest plant trait databases, we see that the most available measurements are plant height, growth form, and DBH. We also see that there are very few leaf trait measurements. Only about 46,000 leaf measurements are available in the TRI database, for example. The largest analysis of leaf shape to date drew from 141 families and used 182,000 individual leaves 
that were collected from numerous clade specific data sets. My goal is to measure leaves for as many angiosperm species as possible, but depending on data availability, I may end up restricting my analysis to six orders. Um, and that would be the Magnoliales, the Phagales, Heracales, Dipsacales, Caryophyllales, and Proteales. Um, each of these orders are broadly distributed throughout the angiosperm phylogeny and represent a broad array of leaf shape diversity. So those orders would represent about 30,000 species. And in that case, I would expect to process roughly a million images, which would produce between three and seven million individual leaf measurements. So some important features of herbarium specimens are the leaves, the fruit and flowers, the text, the barcodes, the rulers, and the color correction card. To get useful measurements out of the images, we need to be able to locate just the parts of the image that we're interested in. And that's where machine learning and computer vision come into the picture. Here is the same specimen after I processed it using my software leaf machine, which I published last year and will be expanding and improving um, as part of my dissertation. Each shaded pixel color represents a component class and boxes are placed around text and rulers and important features. Here are a few more examples. So the green boxes are placed around rulers. The dark blue boxes are placed around text. Light blue are around color correction cards. And then we have masks that are overlaid um, over specific pixels. So the green mask represents leaves, dark blue is stems, text is red, and the background is white. Zooming in closer, we can see how the pixel sem the semantic uh, segmentation actually works. So in the Leaf Machine software, I use primarily two types of machine learning algorithms to autonomously isolate leaves in the image. For masking pixels, I use a convolutional neural network to classify every pixel in the image into one of five classes. And if you're not familiar with convolutional neural networks, this is a diagram that shows the basic idea of how they work. You have an input image and then a series of convolutions, normalizations, and pooling layers that each iteratively learn features that are present in your training data. That results in a prediction. And in this case, it assigns a class label to every pixel in the image. The workhorse of a convolutional neural network is the convolution operation, which is simply the dot product of a subsection of the image and a, a detection filter or a kernel. In this example, if we define the matrix on the right, so the matrix with vertical ones and negative ones, to be our detection kernel, that detection kernel will be able to find vertical lines in an image. But the beauty of a convolutional neural network is that we don't actually have to define a, name, a specific kernel. Instead, we can allow for many kernels that are allowed to vary until they converge and find meaningful features in the training data. So speaking of training data, to train the CNN, I spent a very long time manually painting pixels of ground truth sets of images, um, and that's shown here. Generating training data is by far the most time intensive part of developing machine learning algorithms. Once we have a trained network, Leaf Machine can sort through the identified leaves, figure out which leaves are appropriate to use for scientific research and which are um, noisy or represent clumps. Um, so that leaves us with leaf outlines shown as black and white masks and those outlines can be used for subsequent analysis. The second machine learning algorithm in the LEAF machine is an object detection algorithm. This is similar to the previous convolutional neural network, but also has a portion of the network designed to place bounding boxes around important features. So in this case, I primarily use object detection to locate rulers and text in the herbarium specimen. Once I'm able to locate a ruler, I need to autonomously convert pixel distance into metric distance. Since my data are drawn from many different herbaria that each use different imaging procedures, I had to come up with a flexible set of methods that were capable of determining distances for many different ruler types. 
So here are three example images. Um, for tick marks, I developed a scan line approach, which iteratively crops the ruler image and uses a peak detection function to locate each tick mark. For the middle ruler, it's a lot more, uh, a lot uh, simpler. I can detect rectangles in the image, find the centroid, compare the distances between them, and then we're all set. For the bottom ruler, I implement cross validation. So if the ruler has two sets of tick marks, this produces the most reliable uh, pixel to metric conversion scale. Okay, so now that we can measure lots of leaves, we need a good way to actually describe those leaf shapes. In their 1975 paper, Hickey and Wolf theorized leaf archetypes for major angiosperm clades based on the understanding of angiosperm taxonomy at the time. They described leaf archetypes as the most generalized type from which all of the more specialized types in a taxon could have been derived from an analysis of the comparative morphology of modern leaves. In a general sense, I will be building leaf archetypes in a similar way, but my method will not rely on taxonomy and will instead be quantitatively defined by leaf outline and venation data. I will be developing leaf archetypes using a method called persistent homology. Persistent homology is a topological data analysis method used to measure features of complex sets of points or surfaces. Persistent homology is essentially quantifies changes in data given a filter or a threshold. So here I will note that this is referencing mathematical homology, not biological homology. So we're not talking about a biological structure <clears throat> shared between species. We can visualize this process with a set of points where we expand a disk around each point until enough disks intersect to form a loop. The first intersection of rings would be our first persistent point or birth. And as the disk radius increases, more loops are going to form. So we'll have more births while simultaneously gaps inside some loops may close, which would be the death of a feature. We can plot persistence with births on the X axis and deaths on the Y axis. The births and deaths represent the shape of the data. Um, the persistence points that are furthest from the diagonal contain the highest order shape information or the most persistent shape component. So in this diagram, we can see that the points form an overall loop with smaller loops mixed in. And the green arrow tracks the most persistent shape features birth. And the red arrow tracks its death where the large loop is finally enclosed as the disks are expanding. So that was a one-dimensional homology problem where the dimension refers to the expanding radius of the disk. For image analysis, we can use two-dimensional persistent homology by treating the leaf outline as a point cloud. And we can apply a Gaussian density estimator to the outline, which gives us a density of the image, which is shown as the red and yellow image. Complex features like leaf teeth or lobes have a higher density and appear as yellow in the image. Once we have the outline density, instead of increasing the radius of a disk, we instead slide a window down over the density plot peaks, and that's the threshold that we're using in our persistent homology method. The highest peak will pass through the sliding window first. That'll be our first birth. And otherwise, the process is pretty much the same as before. From the sliding window, moving over the peaks, we can generate an Euler characteristic curve which sums the number of connected components and subtracts any holes. And that gives us this red plot. So you'll notice that there are 16 peaks in this plot. And to get better shape resolution, I'm following Leodal 2018's method of discretizing each leaf into 16 circular components because they found this uh, best demarcated leaf morphospace. Applying persistent homology to other leaves, we can see that each shape produces distinctive Euler characteristic curves and density, uh, density maps. Each curve contains 8,000 points, so it's capable of containing quite a bit of shape data. For each species or group, once I've generated a set of persistence data, I will combine the shape densities by their representation in the sample. So if there were three dominant shape patterns in a species, I would end up generating three different leaf archetypes. 
Um, and then we can compute persistence for each of the archetypes and use those data for subsequent biological analysis. Another major leaf architectural feature is venation. And I won't go into that too much detail about venation right now, but venation does play a role in determining leaf shape. So I will try to account for venation when constructing leaf archetypes. From herbarium images, it's unlikely that I'll be able to retrieve detailed venation images beyond second order vein patterns, um, because third, third order and above patterns usually require microscopic images. So using cleared leaves as ground truth data, I will use another type of machine learning network called a generative adversarial network, or a GAN, which is capable of turning one data type into another. Uh, for example, there's a GAN called StatGAN++, which takes input text, like the words red bird, and outputs a color image of a red bird. Um, so I will use a similar GAN architecture to generate vein arrangements from a categorical vein description, which I can mine from floras for many species, um, such that inputting the word reticulate would generate a reticulate venation. To achieve a full archetype, I will develop a second GAN to assemble the vein architecture and the leaf outline archetype into a single image. I will create leaf archetypes for each of the species in my study and then use persistent homology descriptors for the archetypes in my biological analysis. Okay, and now we're going to transition to my biological aims. So first is heterogeneity in the evolution of interspecific leaf shape variation associated with environmental parameters. And to answer this question, we need to be able to look at the phylogenetic pattern of leaf shape and determine species ranges and climate preferences. For the phylogeny, I will use the all OTB phylogeny from Smith and Brown 2018. This phylogeny has 353,000 tips and I will certainly not have leaf data for all of these taxa but I will query the phylogeny for those that I was able to construct a leaf archetype. To determine environmental preference for each species, I will mine GBIF for occurrence data and then estimate species occupancy using the ecological, ecological niche modeling software, MaxSet, and group species by predicted occurrence. Using the R package phylogenetic EM, I will look for evolutionary model shifts across the phylogeny Phylogenetic EM is a multivariate Bayesian framework for fitting multi-optima Ornstein Olenek models to phylogenetic comparative data and can estimate the placement and magnitude of adaptive shifts directly from the data. And this will be appropriate for my data set because it can handle missing data and it accommodates multiple correlated continuous traits. So this figure shows the result of a phylogenetic EM analysis for the two dominant principal components of brain shape in New World monkeys and you can see the phylogenetic EM identified five shifts across the tree. With leaf shape disparity, I expect a wide variety of patterns to emerge across angiosperms. For my data, the leaf shape traits that I'll be using in the phylogenetic EM analysis will be the persistent homology principal components derived from the leaf archetype Euler characteristic curves. I will also experiment with including other leaf traits like vein architectures, the model conductance, or a specific leaf area to see how other traits influence the heterogeneity that we observe um, for uh, evolutionary models. So returning to the guiding question, I'm not looking to associate specific leaf shapes with environmental parameters, but rather see if shifts in leaf shape disparity are associated with environmental parameters. So irrespective of taxonomy, I will compare leaf shape disparity between clades with different selective regimes. And I expect to see many different patterns. Um, for example, assuming this phylogeny represented a single genus, is a shift to a new evolu evolutionary model associated with a shift in disparity in different climates. So if the top, uh, top black clade are all tropical species, is their overall disparity significantly different than the overall disparity of the temperate maroon clade? All right, so now we'll shift to looking at how disparity relates to diversification. And like I said earlier, in most cases, it's unlikely that speciation or extinction is caused by leaf shape, but speciation could relax or tighten evolutionary constraints on leaf shape. 
can lead to greater or lesser leaf shape disparity. One of the goals of this chapter is to determine to what extent leaf shape is defined by the balancing effects of selection or phylogenetic history. And once again, I will draw on the all OTB phylogeny, but this time I will conduct diversification analyses using BAM. And BAM is designed to detect rate heterogeneity in data sets. And for my project, I intend to use BAM to locate areas in the phylogeny where speciation rates change, and then see how leaf shape disparity relates um, to, to changes in speciation. Um, and then I can use Maxim data from the previous chapter to also look for associations between diversification and disparity relative to environmental parameters. So I expect to find that specific climate envelopes will share diversification disparity relationships among most of their taxa, and that more extreme climates <clears throat> will display a shift in diversification disparity relationship relative to less seasonal climates. One pattern I will be looking for is the relationship between the number of species within an evolutionary regime and overall disparity. For example, the speciation rates in the blue tips are quite low, so we might expect to find high disparity in this clade if leaf shape is a trait that was important in filling the ecological niche space. The blue tip clade might have been explored, uh, the blue tip clade might have explored different leaf shapes and filled in the leaf morpho space. Temperate oaks are a group that may fit this pattern. Their speciation rate is relatively low. There's a lot of sympatric speciation and their leaves are highly diverse. Alternatively, the blue tip clade might have little selection acting on leaf shape or there may be genetic constraints associated with leaf shape. So we could also expect to find low disparity even among a very dense clade. We might expect to find this pattern in tropical groups, for example, where floral characters are under intense selection and leaf shape might not diverge with speciation. In the fast orange tip clade, we also could expect high leaf shape disparity. Rapid speciation may have released a constraint on leaf shape or novel leaf shapes could be selected but if disparity remains low while diversification is high, then we might be able to infer that there are leaf shape constraints in that group. So ecological information from the Maxit model can also be integrated here. Looking broadly across angiosperms, it'll be interesting to see if diversification disparity relationships within clades predictably differ between environments, <clears throat> as that would help inform to what extent leaf shape is adaptive under different environmental conditions. I can also use Maxent data here to look for relationships between evolutionary regime and climate. So if there are predictable relationships for different environments, then we might be able to infer that there are different underlying evolutionary processes driving leaf shape in different environments. So to wrap up, we discussed how I'm going to generate a brand new data set of millions of leaf measurements, how I plan to summarize and represent leaf shape disparity using persistent homology and leaf archetypes. And finally, we talked about how I will look for patterns in the heterogeneity of leaf shape disparity in relation to both environmental parameters and diversification. So I just wanted to thank all of my lab members for their help working out ideas and my committee members and mentors for their time and insightful Great job. Uh, I guess there's time for questions if people have questions. So I have a, a practical question that uh, um, speaks to the kind of data collection aspect um, of the machine learning procedure. So um, you uh, generate these models. Can you give an idea of uh, 
sort of how much um, compute time and effort it takes to generate a model and then maybe what the the scope of those models are and in sort of a kind of a phylogenetic sense you know like how how broadly they're useful once created yeah so i guess um to start the machine learning component i can process an herbarium specimen a specimen of about 20 seconds on like a single threaded operation so it's pretty fast that can be parallelized uh, once we get to persistent homology data and the archetypes, shape information can be applicable in a very broad sense. So I'm interested in looking at the broad macroevolutionary patterns right now. But if you have, um, but the methods I'm developing could be really useful for clade specific studies. Uh, because the way I'm combining leaf shapes into an archetype is it can be it can be extrapolated over any sample set you have. So if you have really fine-grained data, you can you know, look for really, really specific changes in the pattern, even within a specific plate. Um, and the qualitative nature of persistent homology has been used in one paper, and it was able to discriminate differences between genotypes, uh, genotype-phenotype relationships. So it is able to detect really fine-grained differences, which is why I think it's a really exciting um, application to study macroevolutionary processes because it will provide um, really subtle, nuanced shape data that can then be uh, extrapolated at a broader scale. Cool. Uh, there are a bunch of questions in the uh, chat, so I don't know. I, I can. I'll start with Catherine's question. Um, yes. So. Paleo climate inference and leaf shape. I am interested in seeing um, what my type of analysis will show. Um, so the prevalence of leaf teeth in fossil data has been used to infer paleo climate, uh, like mean annual temperature. Um, and it is interesting because that pattern does hold up uh, quite well with using the fossil record. But some more recent studies have questioned that pattern in extant species. Um, so I guess my project would just add more data um, for the extant species approach. Um, and I expect we would find that um, you could still probably reasonably predict daily climate from this sort of data. Um, and the other advantage is if you have data, uh, shape data from fossils, you could apply the same methods I'm developing here to fossil data. And then the fossils could be integrated. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, and then thank you, we, thank you, Will. That's great. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll go to the next question. Um, so, could you say a little bit about why different leaf shapes might be advantageous in different environments? Right. So, um, when I was researching this project, there are quite a few adaptive hypotheses uh, relating to leaf shape. So usually in extreme environments, we see really specific leaf shapes. So in hot, dry climates, the leaves tend to be really narrow and usually are long. And it's thought that that's an advantage for uh, thermal regulation. In tropical environments, a lot of leaves have drip tips, and that's to, <clears throat> to, remove, uh, to remove water that's sitting on the leaf to aid its expiration. Um, so there are, uh, there are good, there's good evidence to assume that leaf shape is advantageous in certain environments. But one thing I'm interested in looking at is if that's true at necessarily the species level, or if to some extent drift is involved in most of the intraspecific, interspecific variation we see. Um, and while uh, maybe the progenitor had some sort of adaptive um, shape advantage, the the extant species we see now might not necessarily have an adaptive advantage. It could have been the result of drift or an extreme. Um, okay, I'm gonna read Jake's question. Okay, so for persistent homology, um, persistent homology is referring to mathematical homology. Um, that's kind of a complicated issue that I am not 100% um, knowledgeable about because persistent homology is a topological data analysis method that is still uh, 
pretty out there for me, but it does not necessarily relate to biological homology. Um, yes, so one interesting thing that I think might get to your question is when we're looking at principal components of persistent homology shape data, it's usually summarizing a set of features simultaneously. So it can be difficult to see which parts of persistent homology is actually being represented um, in relation to the shape that it's describing. So one thing I'm interested in looking at is seeing if we can backtrack and say, oh, this specific principal component area represents a very defined um, shape. And then we could go on um, to maybe start representing homologous features of Um, do I have a favorite leaf? That's an impossible question. Um, I think, oh, it might have to be, it would either be Nepenthes, just because I really like pitcher plants and it's a crazy leaf, or I guess sycamore leaves because they're just huge and really fun. Um, okay, and then David's question. Will you need to exclude species that are highly polymorphic, even on the same individual? I don't recall which clades are targeted. Um, yes, but okay. Um, present to simple to compound leaves on the same batch. Yes. So <clears throat> polymorphism is something that is kind of complicated. So theoretically, I will be able to at least represent archetypes for polymorphic species, because when you start going through, um, you can create clumps of persistent homology data sets. So if you had a species that had lobes and entire leaves, even on the same plant, as long as that was referencing the data set, we would end up having an archetype representing both. So then the complication comes as to how you actually represent that, say, on phylogeny. Um, and that can be kind of complicated. I have a few ideas about that. Um, does that answer your question? Um, so I don't expect to have to exclude polymorphism, um, but it will be difficult to incorporate it effectively in phylogenetic analysis. Um, oh, one more question I missed. Um, okay, so what are you using as your source of your varium images, one particular aggregator or multiple ones? So I've spent a long time just mining as many databases as I can for just Darwin core files. So I've amassed a huge set of Darwin core files from smaller scale herbaria. And I also am working with IDIC Bio and GDIF um, to get the millions of images stored there. <clears throat> So I'm planning to actually draw from as many or various as I possibly can. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't, I think that was all the questions in the chat. Oh. One just came in. Okay. Will you be able to include fossil leaves for any sort of interesting deep time insight? So that, I, I hope so. Um, I don't know exactly what time frame that would work in the project, but um, Stephen and I might be working on a project that would involve fossil data. So um, as long as I can train with leaf machine on fossil data, I definitely would like to incorporate fossil data. Um, so I know Peter Wilf is working on a project in that vein right now, um, where he's using cleared leaves, um, images before and after cleared leaves, and a generative adversarial network to construct fossil leaves from extant leaves. And then um, theoretically that better enables you to, better allows you to place fossils in context of extant species. So um, even if I can't do it, I'm sure someone is going to. Okay, so one more question from Jake. Um, do you think these approaches in combination with phylogeny could help identify good evolutionary homologies 
in leaf morphology and maybe morphological data in general. Uh, I imagine this is really hard for leaf shape, um, but I can also imagine these approaches being able to detect more nuanced evolutionary homologies than we've previously considered. Um, yeah, so that's definitely true. Um, one problem in the Gibnish and Creedle phylogeny from earlier in my presentation um, that they identified is that leaf teeth are not necessarily a homologous feature. Um, in general, they're treated as homologous because we've been concerned that they are an adaptive feature for temperate climates, but that doesn't necessarily mean that leaf teeth are homologous. They can arise for different reasons and have different purposes. Um, so some leaves have hydrothodal teeth, which allow them to expel water uh, to prevent, um, yeah, so to prevent, you know, essentially prevent them from exploding if there's too much water in the plant. <clears throat> So hydrothodal teeth are not necessarily homologous to a different kind of leaf shape teeth. I am <clears throat> anticipating that persistent homology will be able to give us fine grained details so that if you had a known set of you know, specific differences between something like leaf shape teeth, that you could figure out patterns uh, from homology data to figure out if those traits are homologous or not. All right, well, it seems like that is probably it. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, great talk. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks to everybody for coming.